Okay, so uh, as I do, you have a, a handout. Hopefully you, you got the handout uh, just to, to be able to track along uh, some introductory remarks. So if you don't have our study guide, uh, it's for sale in the IPC uh, bookstore. Uh, would encourage you to pick it up. Uh, part of the design of what we've been trying to do within the Word over the last couple of years uh, is not just have a, a Bible study time, but for you during the week to be able to study the passage in advance. Uh, and so this study guide is in that same series that we've used most semesters. Uh, this one's by Eric Redman, who is a, a pastor uh, on Ephesians. Encourage you to pick this up. Uh, and really the only other thing you need is a good study Bible. Uh, you've got a couple of choices there. It's helpful if you use the ESV because the study questions work off of the ESV. Um, so the ESV Study Bible or, or the Reformation Study Bible, uh, that was uh, the general letter for that, R.C. Sproul. Um, fun fact, if you flip open uh, the, the page for the Reformation Study Bible, you might see a name or two you know. Um, so the study guide, the study Bible, that's what you need in order to get through the semester. Um, there's some other recommended resources um, that you can either purchase right now at the IPC bookstore or uh, special order in. Um, if you want a, a, a usable commentary through Ephesians, Sinclair Ferguson's book, Let's Study Ephesians, uh, is excellent. Uh, and uh, because we have a, a wonky return policy with Banner of Truth, uh, we would love to order this for you. Uh, so if you're interested in this, Andrew Ginn, who is our new bookstore manager, uh, is more than willing uh, to order this for you. You could obviously get it on Amazon, other places as well. Uh, but this is a great companion uh, to our study. There's a couple of other study Bibles that are different than uh, the ESV Study Bible and the Reformation Study Bible that you might find useful. Uh, one, the Gospel, Trans Gospel Transformation Study Bible uh, that Brian Chappell was the general, general editor uh, for that, uh, I worked on the Exodus notes, as you might remember. Um, the Ephesian notes are very well done. I think it's Kevin DeYoung uh, did the Ephesians notes. Gospel Transformation Study Bible, uh, one of the ways of thinking about that resource is the ESV Study Bible might be a lecture, uh, and the Gospel Transformation Study Bible is the sermon. It's the application and how this particular text points you to the gospel, points you to Christ. So it's an excellent resource, and I, I use it in, co in uh, coordination with the ESV Study Bible when I, when I study. Another study Bible, though, that, I just, that just came out, and I've been using it in my uh, morning worship times, is the Bible Speaks Today Study Bible that InterVarsity produced. It's the NIV text, but why this is particularly useful, um, InterVarsity produced a commentary series under the editorship of Eric, uh, Alec Matier and um, John Stott called The Bible Speaks Today. And they basically excerpted... Uh, appropriate sections from the entire commentary series and put it next to the biblical text, which is incredibly helpful um, because I have a lot of those commentaries on my shelf. Uh, and so to have those notes in that uh, format as part of uh, a study Bible, extremely, extremely helpful. So um, the bookstore has both of those Bibles if you're interested. So, so those are the resources we're going to use. Um, again, just if you're new to us, we have a, a, a basic structure uh, generally, 6.30, uh, we'll be greeting you, a few announcements, opening prayer, uh, and then we'll get right into the text for the week. And so there's the schedule. Uh, tonight, today is uh, often due to when we begin, uh, we're going to have an overview on how to approach Ephesians with some basic kind of New Testament introduction questions. Uh, but then next week, next Thursday, uh, we'll be looking at the first 14 verses uh, of Ephesians, and you can just follow along, and each week matches one of the lessons in the study guide. Uh, and we hope to finish up on November the 12th, uh, Lord willing. Uh, so we'll, we'll teach through that text uh, about 30 minutes, give you about 20 minutes or so uh, for discussion time. Uh, and as, uh, as we started doing last semester, there are dis potential discussion questions at the end of the lesson. Uh, and so you'll find that in your notes for today as well. You can use those questions uh, for your table discussion. Other questions that might occur to you, either from your own study or from what you hear from me, um, it's, it's an opportunity to discuss together uh, and to think a little bit uh, more uh, about the text. And then right at 7.30, a close in prayer, uh, and you're out. Uh, if you need to s escape earlier to head off to work, that's okay. No one's going to judge you in any which way. Uh, we're just glad that you're here, okay? So, uh, 
that brings us then to Ephesians. Uh, and uh, if you just flip through, you'll see the questions uh, that we'll consider today. Who wrote Ephesians? Uh, to whom and when was Ephesians written? What about the parallels between uh, Ephesians and Colossians? More on that in a moment. And then what are some of the key themes here in Ephesians? Uh, and then I'll, you'll see the outline uh, and we'll be done. So who wrote Ephesians? Well, until modern times, uh, the Pauline authorship, the idea that the Apostle Paul wrote this letter to the Ephesians, that, it was undisputed. Uh, and right at the beginning of the epistle, if you have your Bibles, you'll see it in chapter 1, verse 1, Paul identifies himself as he does in all of these letters. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, uh, by the will of God. Uh, and then later, in chapter 3, verse 1, he identifies himself again. For this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, on behalf of you Gentiles. So, so twice in this letter, Paul identifies himself uh, as the author. Uh, and for 1,900 years, uh, that was deemed good enough to establish Pauline authorship. But there's some other clues internal to this letter uh, that, that suggest Pauline authorship. Um, in chapter 1, verse 15, he, he suggests that he has personal knowledge uh, of the Ephesians. Chapter 1, verse 15. For this reason, he says, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. Um, so he, he demonstrates a personal knowledge of the Ephesians, and presumably the Ephesians would have known uh, the writer uh, who identifies himself as Paul. Uh, also, he, he mentions twice that he... Uh, was a prisoner. Uh, chapter 3, verse 1, I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus on behalf of you Gentiles. Chapter 4, verse 1, I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called. And that fits what we know of his, his biography, as I'm going to suggest here in a moment. We think it's likely that Paul wrote this letter from uh, house arrest in Rome uh, around AD 62. And so the fact that the author identifies himself as Paul uh, and his, his, his identifying details, his biographical details, match what we know of his biography, that also lends weight to this Pauline uh, identification. Uh, but also in the salutation, uh, another person is mentioned, Tychicus. Uh, so chapter 6, verse 21, so that you may also know uh, how I am and what I am doing. Tychicus, the beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, will tell you everything. I have sent him to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are, and that he may encourage your hearts. So, presumably, uh, the author, Paul, wouldn't mention Tychicus, a person known to the church at Ephesus, uh, if he was lying. Um, Tychicus could vouch for Paul as the author, uh, and especially because the writer says he's going to let you know how I'm doing. Uh, so those three internal witnesses uh, support, we believe, uh, the idea that the Apostle Paul wrote the letter to the Ephesians. From about A.D. 140 on, an uh, early church theologian named uh, Marcion uh, identifies Paul as the author of this letter. Uh, it's, it's undisputed. Uh, so for 1,800 years... Um, all of these witnesses together uh, identified this letter as a Pauline letter. Now, 19th century uh, and beyond to our own day, many critical scholars deny and have denied that Paul wrote this letter, uh, and they have at least three objections. Uh, the first is that the letter's style and thought does not appear to be characteristically Pauline. Uh, or on that in a minute. Uh, the other, a second reason, second objection, uh, is that the letter has striking parallels to Colossians, uh, which raises a question of whether uh, Colossians was in fact Pauline, uh, but there was an imitator uh, who then used Colossians as the basis for this letter to the Ephesians and simply wrote it under a pseudonym. Um, the third objection is that the author does not appear to be familiar with the letter's recipients. In chapter 1, verse 15, which on the one side seems to suggest personal knowledge, on the other side is a little odd uh, in the light of Paul's extensive knowledge uh, of 
of the church at Ephesus. Chapter 1, verse 15, for this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints. Well, Acts 19, Acts 20, uh, Paul's done more than heard. <laughs> uh, Paul has spent an extensive amount of time in the church, at the church at Ephesus. He planted it. He knew them. Um, chapter 20 has the affecting scene at Miletus when he calls for the Ephesian elders and he weeps over them. Um, so it's, it's a little odd, uh, chapter 1, verse 15, because I've heard of your faith. And some have said, well, that, that, that's evidence that he really has no, no sense of these people. He's simply pr- proposing as Paul. Uh, and so he didn't write it. There's a couple of other places too. Many of the Pauline letters have personal greetings. You know, when you look at Romans chapter 16, uh, there's a whole laundry list of people that Paul knows in Rome. Uh, here in Ephesians, as we'll see at the end, the only person he mentions is Tychicus, who is the conveyor of this letter to uh, the church. So that's a little odd as well. So those three objections are, are the typical objections uh, that uh, scholars raise to suggest that, well, Paul may be listed at the heading, but he didn't really write it. It was an imitator. Now, there are good answers to those objections to the Pauline authorship of Ephesians. Uh, the first objection, not Pauline style. Um, this, this, this letter reads differently, has different theological themes than Romans or Galatians. That's the idea. And one of the things is, it seems pretty clear is that uh, analyses of an author's style are relatively subjective. Uh, if someone were to take, um, uh, the, if someone were to kind of uncover a cache of uh, things that you've written, perhaps for work, um, uh, memorandums, uh, contracts, uh, p- proposals, presentations, and those are the only things they have that you wrote. And then they run across a love letter to your wife that's signed by you. And that's, they have that as well. But they have this group of writings and this love letter. Well, Jack didn't write this love letter. It's an imitator. It doesn't match his style. We have all of these other documents that Jack wrote. Uh, This demonstrates he didn't write. Well, you would know, no, you you write different letters for different reasons. Just because the preponderance of style goes one way doesn't necessarily rule out uh, that you could have written something else. Well, it's the same thing here. Uh, The evidence that we have, we have 13 letters for Paul, uh, if you don't count Hebrews, Um, 13 letters from Paul in the New Testament. Certainly he wrote more, uh, and it very well could be that uh, Ephesians was written for a particular purpose uh, that is different than uh, Romans and Galatians, and you would expect him to use uh, somewhat of a different style. And yet, even having said that, there's a, there are, uh, there's a great deal of similarity in terms of theme, uh, in terms of word choice, in terms of theology. Uh, of Ephesians does not rest uneasily with Romans. Um, they, they actually do fit together, um, even though Romans seems in chapters 3 and 4 uh, to focus on justification, uh, and Ephesians has more cosmic, uh, more cosmic redemptive orientation, still they they do fit together. Uh, they are not opposed to one another. Um, so that objection really does, uh, it doesn't seem to hold as much weight. Uh, one that the next two hold a little bit more weight, uh, the relationship to Colossians. Uh, we're going to talk about this in a minute. There is a strong relationship between Ephesians and Colossians. Um, but that, that relationship is better explained by the Pauline authorship of both letters, that Paul wrote both Ephesians and Colossians, uh, rather than saying, well, he wrote Colossians, and then some later imitator came and wrote Ephesians, kind of cribbing off of Colossians. Oh, yeah, I know what I'll do. I'll I'll just take this letter and pose as Paul and and take some of the themes and rework them and claim it as mine. Now, that might work for your teenager in his English class, right, Uh, to to plagiarize something else, but it's more likely that Paul wrote both letters uh, and had a particular purpose in doing so, uh, and he wrote them near the same time, uh, and so would have shared ideas, shared thoughts, shared structure. That makes more sense. Two, it'd be a little odd um, for the writer of this letter, in chapter 4, verse 25, he says, Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each of you speak the truth with his neighbor, 
for we are members of one another. Uh, So he's telling them, put away falsehood, don't lie. Oh, but I'm going to lie about my identity. I'm going to pose as Paul, but I'm not really Paul. But you guys, stop lying. Now, our politicians might try to do that, tell you to do one thing and do another, right? Uh, But but it would be weird uh, for a letter uh, going to a church um, to do that. And so there is a relationship with Colossians, but we think it can be explained in a different way. The third objection, um, this odd lack of personal knowledge uh, in this letter, um, if this were a circular letter, and again, more on this in a moment, uh, that is, if this was a letter that was meant to be shared with a number of churches, uh, not just one, it would make sense then uh, that the Apostle Paul would not include personal detail. Um, If I was going to write a letter that was going to be shared among a lot of people, uh, I wouldn't start identifying personal details or people I knew necessarily. Now, every, every Thursday I write a pastor's letter or I do a pastor's video. And I try to cast that net as wide as possible so it can meet a range of circumstances within the, 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 the congregation. Well, you would think Paul would do the same if, in fact, this is a circular letter, uh, which I think it was. Um, that brings you to, to whom was this written? Um, I think this letter, uh, and I think we have good reasons to believe the Apostle Paul wrote this letter, um, but there are some good reasons to question whether this was directed solely to the church at Ephesus. Well, chapter 1, verse 1, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus. So, uh, Ephesus, the church uh, in Ephesus is the identification here. Uh, well, where was Ephesus? What, what was Ephesus? We well, have a little map there in your notes. Uh, Ephesus is, um, a, was an important port city uh, on the west coast of Asia Minor in modern-day Turkey. Uh, it was actually an inlet port, uh, so you would come off the Aegean, uh, come into this inlet Uh, And the city was built at the end of the inlet over time. That ancient harbor, that inlet, would be filled with silt, uh, just from uh, the the silt washing into that little uh, sliver of land that created the harbor. Uh, And once that uh, inlet became filled with silt, the city would eventually be abandoned uh, because its main uh, economic connector to the rest of the world was was undone for them. Uh, But during Paul's day, Uh, Ephesus was a a major port city, and it was the home of the Temple of Artemis, one of the so-called seven wonders of the ancient world. Um, If you've read Acts, in Acts 19, the Temple of Artemis uh, is going to uh, loom large in that chapter. Uh, There's going to be some who suggest in Ephesus that that the Apostle Paul and his traveling companions were somehow denigrating uh, Artemis of the Ephesians, and a riot breaks out, and um, Paul fears for his life because of the, the rioting uh, around this temple of Artemis. It's kind of the, the identification mark uh, of that place and of that city. Uh, so, so Paul comes to Ephesus during his third missionary journey, which is described in Acts starting in chapter 18, um, verse 24, and extending through chapter 20. And then you have the scene with the Ephesian elders at the end of chapter 20. Um, And he spends a great deal of time in Ephesus, starting this church, nurturing this church. Uh, But the church at Ephesus was well served. Apollos would spend time in Ephesus. Timothy I would spend time in Ephesus. When Paul writes First and Second Timothy, he's writing to Timothy as he is serving in Ephesus. Uh, Timothy is uh, often credited in church history as the first bishop of Ephesus. Uh, later, the Apostle John will serve that church as well. Uh, so uh, the church in Ephesus is going to have a, a, a number of significant early church leaders. It's a major church uh, right there on the edge of the Aegean uh, in the western part of Asia Minor. Uh, And so this letter uh, is written to the saints who are in Ephesus, uh, but it's likely, as I've suggested, that it was a circular letter uh, passed around Ephesus and other churches in Asia Minor. Um, In the Greek New Testament, uh, the the, uh, the textual evidence for uh, that phrase, in Ephesus, is actually not super strong. 
some of the earliest uh, codices of the Greek, New, of the Greek text that we have for, uh, for this letter uh, actually leave in Ephesus out, um, which then causes uh, all sorts of questions. Uh, well, why was it left out? Um, was it so that the copyists, uh, after they took the initial letter, could, could insert uh, other churches' names like Laodicea or like Philadelphia or like Sardis, other churches? You, know those churches from the seven churches of the Revelation, right? Um, Ephesus is the first listed among those seven churches, but so is Sardis, so is Laodicea, so is Philadelphia. So did, so did Paul intend this letter, similar to the Revelation, to be circulated among those seven churches? Did he intend this letter to be circulated among five, seven churches directly around Ephesus? It appears uh, that the textual evidence, as well as some of this internal evidence, would lean that way. Another clue, though, comes from uh, the letter to the Colossians. Uh, In chapter 4, in verse 16, um, well, backing up to verse 15, um, uh, Paul, in writing to the Colossians, says, Give my greetings to the brothers at Laodicea and to Nymphia and the church in her house. And when this letter has been read among you, have it also read in the church of the Laodiceans, And see that you also read the letter from Laodicea. Well, we obviously don't have a letter from Laodicea in our New Testament. Could it be that this letter, the letter to the Ephesians, was actually that circular letter that was originally written to Laodicea? Marcion, who I mentioned earlier, uh, in, in identifying this letter as Pauline, uh, suggested that this letter was, in fact, the letter directed to Laodicea. Um, so there's, there's a number of clues that suggest that, well, at a bare minimum, uh, this letter was, in fact, a circular letter uh, that was, was circulated among a number of churches. Uh, and we think that, that uh, the church at Ephesus was one of the churches intended, Clement of Alexandria, uh, who lived from 150 to 215, Irenaeus, early church father, 130 to 202. Um, they both cite from this letter as the letter to the Ephesians. So by the second century, um, about a hundred years after the Apostle John, um, this letter was recognized, uh, by them at least, as the letter to the Ephesians. Um, Two, Clement of Rome, at around AD 95, he quotes from this letter, doesn't identify it, but quotes from it as a Pauline letter. Uh, so this letter is recognized as canonical, recognized as part of our New Testaments, uh, and at least among some of the early church fathers, recognized as a letter to the Ephesians. So, so if this was a circular letter, then it would explain both why it could be identified uh, as being directed to the Ephesians, but also why some of these curious details, uh, lack of identifying uh, uh, people at the end of the letter, uh, lack of sense of personal knowledge for a church with, in which Paul had invested so much, it would explain that. Uh, and it takes away that critical objection uh, that, in fact, this was not uh, Paul's letter. So, who wrote this letter? Well, the Apostle Paul, that's, that's what we would say. Um, to whom was this letter written? Well, we, certainly the church at Ephesus, but perhaps other churches uh, in Asia Minor as well. Um, it was written from prison, uh, we believe, when Paul is in, ha- under house arrest at the end of Acts 28. Um, it's likely at that point in time, along with Colossians, perhaps Philippians as well, um, the letter to, the, to, to Philemon, all of those letters are, are likely written around the same time uh, in AD 62. But I mentioned these, these parallels between Ephesians and Colossians. Well, what about that? Um, One of the most unique features of this letter to the Ephesians uh, are these these striking, striking parallels uh, between the two letters. If you you put your finger uh, in the the letter to the Colossians uh, and just kind of flip back and forth, uh, you begin to see some of these these parallels. Um, You have a similar um, greeting uh, and opening kind of benediction uh, to um, both places. So chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Uh, in Ephesians, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you 
and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, in Colossians, you have the same thing. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father. Very similar opening greeting. Um, In chapter 1, verse 10, uh, in Ephesians, Paul talks about this plan that God has for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven, and things on earth. When you look at Colossians chapter 1, verse 20, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of the cross. The sense of cosmic redemption and cosmic reconciliation in which all things are reconciled in Christ. You have it both in Ephesians and in Colossians. Um, Ephesians chapter 1 Verse 15, for this reason, because I've heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. Uh, Well, in Colossians uh, chapter 1, verse 3, we always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all the saints. Again, both places speaking of, we've heard of your faith, we've heard of your love, Um, it's, they're striking parallels. Uh, and I'll let you trace out some of these others, but, but particularly when you get to the household, co- household codes, uh, in Ephesians chapter 5, starting in verse 22, you'll find parallels uh, in the letter to the Colossians as well. And these are the two places in Paul's letters where he, he moves from uh, wives and husbands, children, fathers, slaves, masters. Uh, so again, These parallels are are incredibly striking. Uh, And as we mentioned, it's caused some to believe, well, maybe there's a dependence, uh, a dependence of Ephesians on Colossians. Uh, But again, it's it's much more likely to say, if Paul wrote these two letters at a similar time and for a similar purpose, as circular letters meant to instruct the churches of Asia Minor in the gospel, it wouldn't be surprising that there would be overlap of theme or even overlap of wording. Uh, He intends to hit a number of churches with these letters, and he's trying to instruct them further in this gospel that he's proclaimed to them. So what is this gospel? What are the the theological themes uh, that you would find in this letter to the Ephesians? Well, uh, there's many themes, but three big themes, uh, dealing with Christ, dealing with salvation, dealing with the church. So first... uh, dealing with Christ. Um, there, there are different ways in which the doctrine of Christ plays out uh, in this letter to the Ephesians. One of the things that's notable about Ephesians and Colossians uh, is this, for a lack of a better way of saying it, this kind of cosmic Christology, this kind of uh, sense that, that Jesus Christ is the cosmic ruler of the universe, uh, and he's bringing, he will bring uh, and is bringing unity to all things. He's reconciling all things to himself in, in himself. So, for example, in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7, um, Paul writes, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time, to unite all things in him, things in heaven, and things on earth. And as I'll say again next week when we look at this in more detail, that word unite has the idea of of summarizing or of tying together so that that God's purpose, is his cosmic purpose, is his salvation history purpose is to tie everything together, things in heaven, things on, on earth, in Jesus Christ, so they are all reconciled in him. Uh, well, how's that happen uh, in just a man? Well, no, Jesus is more than a man. He's the God-man, uh, and he is working out a cosmic redemption so that all that he has made is, is somehow brought into his redemptive purpose and plan. But there's also this royal Christology. Yes, he's, he's cosmic, uh, has a purpose for, for all things, for heavens, the heavens and the earth, uh, but he's also the king over all things. At the end of chapter 1, um, Christ is seated uh, at God's right hand, chapter 1, verse 20, in the heavenly places, far above all rule, authority, power, and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. 
And he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So Christ rules over all things and he rules over all powers. Uh, So in in the ancient world conception, uh, the, the true authorities are supernatural authorities. Authorities that we cannot see. And this letter opens and closes with with a reference to those supernatural authorities. Rule, authority, power, dominion. Uh, That's not Rome. Uh, That's the enemy's territory. Uh, The various uh, legions of of demons, but also of of God's people, of angels and archangels, uh, cherubim, seraphim. Over all these supernatural powers, Christ is the head. He is the king. And he rules over all things for his own glory. But according to this passage here at the end of chapter 1, for the benefit of the church. Which, as we'll say when we get there, is a remarkable, remarkable thing to think of. That we, as Christ's church, are part of his rule. That he is ruling to benefit his church. Doesn't feel that way. Doesn't feel that way right now, does it? But that's, that's our feelings, not our facts. The fact is, Christ is ruling over all things. He has put all rule, authority, power, and dominion under his feet. He is seated at the Father's right hand in the heavenly places. He does hold session. That, those are the facts. We may not have eyes to see it all the time, but it is true. Christ Jesus, even now, is ruling over all things for the benefit of the church. So this royal Christology is, is a keynote of this letter. And yet this, the, these cosmic and royal themes are also set next to a, a suffering Christology, that Jesus the Christ came uh, to suffer, uh, to be raised from the dead, and ultimately uh, to ascend to the right hand of the Father. Uh, one of the things, and I'll mention this when we, I just touch briefly on the outline, uh, but one of the things structurally to recognize is that Paul starts praying in chapter 1, verse 15, and he doesn't actually stop. Uh, he gets distracted, but then he comes back and prays in chapter 3 at the end. So everything from chapter 1, verse 15 to the end of chapter 3 is part of this larger prayer that Paul's praying. And what is he praying about? Well, that you would have eyes to understand that the same power that raised Jesus from the dead is at work in you. This resurrection power that raised Jesus from the dead is actually present, having raised you from the dead spiritually and will raise you physically from the dead. That same resurrection power is at work in you. And Paul wants you to have eyes to see it. Uh, As part of that, though, the centrality of those gospel moments, the cross, the resurrection, uh, and the ascension are, are... are threaded through this letter. Uh, And in fact, in chapter 4, it should be verses 7 to 11, um, this is one of the the few places in Paul's letters where he talks about the benefits of the ascension uh, for the people of God. Uh, When he says, grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. And saying, he ascended, what does it mean? But that he also descended into the lower regions, the earth. And he who descended is is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. And what did he give then? He gave apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, and teachers. There you get a a taste of of this ascension theology and why this is significant for the people of God. With these, These key redemptive moments that we confess in the creed, they're right here in this letter. And this suffering Christology, this, this incarnational Christology, the work of Christ on earth and his humiliation and exaltation, it sits beside and is interwoven with uh, Paul's emphasis on Christ's uh, cosmic reality that he's bringing unity to all things uh, as well as his royal uh, rule over all things and all powers. So a lot about Jesus uh, and his rule over his world in this letter. But coupled together with this Christology is, is uh, much teaching concerning salvation or soteriology. Um, at the very beginning of this letter, we see that our salvation is, is, is rooted in a triune purpose and plan. Um, this is one of my favorite passages, chapter, three verses, uh, chapter 1, verses 3 to 14, uh, because it's yet another witness to the Trinity. Every spiritual blessing that we have comes from the Father, through the Son, by the Spirit. And so chapter 1, verses 3 to 6, uh, we see what it is that God the Father does for us. He chooses 
Chapter 1, verses 7 to 10, we see what God the Son does for us. He redeems us. In chapter 1, verses 11 to 14, we see, especially in verses 13 and 14, we see what the Spirit does. Uh, He seals us and guarantees for us so great salvation. The triune purpose, the triune plan, uh, is that every blessing might come to us from the Father, through the Son, by the Spirit. But central to the way Ephesians conceives of our salvation is through this idea of union with Christ. Um, uh, 34 times in this letter, either in Christ or in him is used. Uh, and together, taken together with, um, with language in chapter 2, verse 5, uh, where we, uh, we've been made alive together with Christ, we've been raised up with him, we've been seated with him in the heavenly places, this with language. You take the in Christ, in him language, and the with language, and you put it all together, and what you find is that every spiritual blessing that comes to us also comes to us because we have been united or married to Christ. So that uh, in a very real way, uh, the Holy Spirit serves as a bond between us and Jesus. Uh, And all that is true about Jesus is is true of us. He's righteous, so are we. He's holy, so are we. He's God's Son. We share in His Sonship, so we are sons of the Heavenly Father. He's glorified, so are we. He's seated in the heavenly places, so are we. Uh, this, this theological theme of union with Christ uh, gets right to the heart of our salvation. John Calvin, that great 16th century French pastor and theologian, uh, observed in the beginning of, of book three of his institutes that, that uh, the work of Christ would not benefit us if it remained outside of us if it remained, his word, alien to us, external to us. It actually had to come to us and in us. How did that happen? Well, at the end of, chapter, of book 3, chapter 1, section 1, Calvin says, it comes to us by the bond of the Holy Spirit in uniting us to Christ. Every benefit that Christ has won for us on the cross, the empty tomb, the ascension, comes to us by way of our union with Christ. So we're very much going to see that uh, as we work our way through this letter. There's all the, also this already not yet aspect to this salvation, uh, because you might be saying, wait a second, um, I'm seated in the heavenly places of Christ? I thought I was sitting in the fellowship hall. How, how does this happen? You know, well, already God sees you as seated in the heavenly places, but you're not there yet, right? Uh, and that's the tension we live in, uh, that, that these things are true, uh, of what Christ has done for us. Uh, by way of the cross and the empty tomb. Uh, And yet we do not yet fully realize uh, all that has been done for us, the mystery of the gospel worked out in our lives. And we'll trace this theme of this already not yet reality to our salvation through this letter. Finally, um, Paul's going to have a lot to say about the church and life in the church. Um, As believers who have learned Christ, uh, we have a new power to live out our ethical responsibilities in the context of the church. Uh, So there's much here about how we live in our households in ways that mark us as those who have been united to Christ. Um, We're to live with one another. Um, uh, Despite our our racial, ethnic, cultural differences, uh, we are one new humanity uh, in Christ. And all the challenge that comes with being white and black and brown uh, and all the difference that comes as a result of our our skin colors and our cultural and economic realities. And there's a more fundamental reality. Uh, this diversity finds its unity, not in some kind of political program, but in the very blood of Christ. Through the cross of Jesus Christ, we have been made one new humanity and the dividing wall has born, been torn down. And so part of the church's responsibility is to live into that ethical responsibility. Uh, this reality that is true because of the work of Christ. We're also to live into the various images uh, that Paul gives us here of the church. We are a body, in fact, Christ's own body of which he's the head. Uh, We are his temple in which the Holy Spirit dwells, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus as the cornerstone. We are a commonwealth. Um, We are part of a a holy nation. Uh, We are part of God's household. We are families in God's family. And finally, we are Christ's bride, uh, a bride that he cherishes, uh, a, bride, a bride that he presents to himself 
uh, as his very own. Each of these images tells us something important about who we are as the church. So we'll see a lot of this as we work our way through the letter. Just briefly then about the structure uh, of the letter. There are two big sections in the letter, um, uh, and uh, they really do... uh, really do follow the pattern of the gospel itself. Uh, The first three chapters are what I call indicative, or things that are true. Uh, An indicative statement that is, that's what's true. So when you look at my my son, my six foot, 210 pound middle linebacker, uh, everyone says, when they look at him, whoa, he's big. That is a true statement. Ben is big. Uh, That's also indicative. Uh, That's an indicative statement. When we think about the indicatives of the gospel, we're thinking about things that are true. Um, not, and ultimately, they're true because God, through Jesus Christ, makes them true. And so the, in, the overarching indicative of the th- first three chapters of Ephesians, I would say, is that the resurrection power of Jesus is at work in you. Uh, and as I'm going to s- say, too, the, the, resurrection of power, the resurrection power of God uh, at work in you, it, it was at work in Christ. Here's how it's played out in you. You were dead in trespasses and sins. Now you've been raised with Christ. That's true. That is what is true about you. And in the light of what is true, Paul's going to go on, starting in chapter 4, verse 1, and tell you what to do. Uh, indicative always is followed by imperative. And that order is important. What is true comes before what to do. We tend to want to reverse the order. We tend to want to start with what we do in order to get to true things about us. Uh, But when we do that, we end up undercutting the gospel itself. Paul's order in Ephesians, and indeed throughout the Bible, now is what is true about you because of what God has done for you, uh, preeminently in Jesus Christ. And then in the light of what is true, here's how we are to live then. So we'll unpack, uh, hopefully, this outline uh, as we come through the semester Uh, But I want you to notice at least uh, that fundamental structure of indicative imperative, what is true and then what to do. So we've got about 15 minutes or so, uh, and you have some discussion questions there uh, you may want to take up. Um, I particularly encourage you to take that last question. What do you hope to get out of studying this letter to the Ephesians this spring? Um, But uh, there's a number of of, uh, questions here. Perhaps you've thought of others. Talk around the table uh, about what God has been showing you even this morning as you think about Ephesians.